welcome to our panel on disability representation in TV and film. And my name is Kathy Coleman, and I'm the artistic director of the Disability Art and Culture Project. Um, and this panel is part of our um, program right now that we're having. It's a film festival in Portland. Um, this is actually will be Portland's very first disability film festival, so we're really excited about that. Um, we're partnering with a national group called Real Abilities, and they have um, they support um, film festivals all over the country. Um, so we're really excited to be a partner with them. And the films will be showing at Alberta Rose Theater um, next weekend, May 27th through the 29th. And if you go on the website, portland.realabilities.org, you can see all the different films. There's shorts, there's feature lengths, there's a comedy night, there's a time for local films, there's just tons of great films that are gonna be played that weekend. So um, I hope you guys will be able to make it. Um, and you can also buy your tickets on Alberta Rose Theater website. And so I'd like to start by introducing our panel for today. And um, first we have Bryony Nesbitt. Bryony is a wordsmith with a degree in English and minors in writing and gender sexuality studies. So that's, there we go, Bryony. <laughs> um, they are currently working on a chapbook in, the, in a tiny house near Portland, Oregon. Bryony, in combination with their two cats, is leading the fight for queer youth spaces in the world. Keep on the lookout for the newest rant poem story to head out of Bryony's overhead packed, overpacked head. <laughs> and the next we have Courtney Herman. And um, Courtney is an award-winning independent documentary filmmaker and video educator from Portland, Oregon. Her most recent independent films include Crying, Earth Rise Up, Exotic World and the Burlesque Revival, and Standing Silent Nation. And Courtney is on the, is on the faculty of the theater, School of Theater and Film at Portland State University, where she teaches film and video production classes. She's also the co-owner of her Boxcar Assembly, a nonfiction media production company. And Courtney holds an MFA degree in film and video production from Columbia College, Chicago. And last but not least, we have Cheryl Green, who's a white disabled media and performance artist focusing on disability culture, society, and challenging ableism. She gives presentations and trainings on disability and media, ableism, and arts and brain injury rehabilitation. Cheryl's also a closed captioner and transcriptionist, making streaming audio and video more accessible. She's on the board of Disability Art and Culture Project and volunteers at Cortland Community Media and KBU Community Radio. And she worked with VSA Texas and volunteered with Portland Commission on Disability and the Na National Black Disability Coalition. And so here's our panel. And thank you guys all for coming today. I really appreciate it. Um, the first question I have for all of you is, could you each tell us about your relationship to the arts and what motivated you to be on a panel about disability and other marginalized group representation in media? Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a writer, obviously, as I said in my bio, uh, and a, a poet mostly. Um, but I've been doing uh, some acting gigs around town. Um, and there's not enough representation of me as a able-bodied seeming person who is absolutely not, and even sometimes I forget that, um, as a genderqueer individual also, and we're just, there's not enough representation for intersectionalities out there at all. And um, to speak on a panel to represent disability in a way is really important to me to not even just recognize my own disability, but to be um, a voice for the many people that I now have become um, disability porn for. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just to be like, we're here, we're all here, stop, stop doing that. Um, it was important, and I think it's important. Thank you. Courtney. Um, I am excited to be here. Um, I am um, not a member of the disability community, but um, I, um, I am a member of an underrepresented community, um, and uh, being a queer woman in film, 
Um, and um, also in my work as an independent filmmaker and um, in my video production work making nonfiction content, um, I have often worked with communities who are underrepresented communities. Um, and so um, I also in my role as an educator, um, as I'm helping my students um, and shepherding them and their projects, um, in, in particular in documentary, but also in fiction, um, in film, it, there's been many times where um, we've had to deal with issues where the maker is not necessarily a part of the community that they are, um, are, are working with and making the film with. So, um, yeah, that's me. Thanks. <laughs> Relationship to go. the arts. So why am I here? Okay, thanks. Didn't I help you write these questions? I, I think you did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I just want to say that Courtney was my documentary film teacher, and and it's for real what you said, and that was really valuable for me because I also I think similarly to how you described up here to be non-disabled, but I don't identify that way, and that's not my life experience. And when I consume media that is about my community, I don't see very much that's made by someone from my community or a. Re it's just pretty much non-disabled people making the media, and so it tends to have an outsider feel. It tends to have, it tends to be very clinical. A lot of things starting with statistics about, you know, this disability and this diagnosis, and, and, and uh, it loses that, it just loses some human edge, and so I make media because I can, I have access to it, and I do a lot of work where I give my equipment to other people at no charge, so they will make media. Um, I, and I learned from Narcel Ritas, filmmaker, that people who consume a lot of media should be also the ones making a lot of media. You should not just consume it. And so that's a, that's a big deal to me from the, uh, dis for the disability community. Um, so I'm just happy to be able to be here to talk about it and to share about what's really important about the disability community making its own media, um, seeing it as a community and a culture and not just like, failed normal people or slightly broken normal people and anybody can make a film about you but we we are empowered to make our own media and it's nice for others outside the community to recognize that um, what role does media play in creating and influencing culture hmm. what role does media not play in creating <laughs> and influencing culture <laughs> I think that is the question yeah. mm -hmm. um, it I mean we we're surrounded by media all of the time and whether we know it or not by osmosis it's getting into our brains and our skin um, and um, it's creating um, our realities in many ways and for many people um, and so I think it's extraordinarily important that media is inclusive of all kinds of experiences and not just the experiences of those who hold in their hands the tools to create this media which is why what Cheryl's describing is so important which is you know pick up a camera, you know, and now in the digital age, um, it's, you know, everyone has a video camera in their purse, in their pocket, mm -hmm. and um, can hook that up to some sort of, you know, internet somewhere and, and share it with the world. Any other thoughts, comments, thoughts? Mm -hmm. I, I literally read an article today um, I have multiple sclerosis. Uh, I have both been in a wheelchair and now I actively go out and I dance on the regular because it's my self care. Um, but I don't, I don't look disabled at all, but I just spent three days in bed because I couldn't function. Um, and this to curb on the end of that is pretty epically important because, um, it's that they don't, uh, it's not seeing the things that I've been through. Um, it's not seeing the things that I can't do. It's any representation of anybody like me is the worst possible scenario you can get. So this is why I don't generally consume media like that because I'm like, I'm doing amazing. How am I doing amazing? Yet I've been on the bad. I've been on the sleeping for 18 hours out of a day, um, 24 hours a day, literally not able to function. Um, and that, that story is not told. I am gratefully, I put on um, a play not that long ago combined with the MS Society and it's being printed. 
in, um, I'm going to be in the, in the uh, Library of Congress and stuff like that. But it's literally the only MS media that is going out there and they want that because it's, we're not out there. Our stories aren't out there and our stories, they need to be out there. So everybody keeps telling me like, write a book. And I was like, I, I don't have the energy to write a book. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of energy, but like the representation needs to be there because all we see are either people who do currently look like me, like I'm doing great with this thing, but they don't tell about the bad days. And so people don't understand the bad days. Um, and that representation absolutely isn't there. And, and, and when I consume media, um, specifically Breaking Bad had um, a CP boy. And I was like, oh yeah, it's really a, and it turns out it may not have been, I can't remember what I read on the after, that he may have been, he, I don't remember if he did have it or he didn't, I can't remember. Um, but like, that's the thing is we're not represented. People in wheelchairs are being played by able-bodied people. And I was like, you know, there are plenty of people out there who are in wheelchairs who could probably zoom that around way better than the actor you just put in that wheelchair. Just, just saying, or people to represent us, we can represent ourselves just fine if they would just have us. And we're, we're able to do it. We really are as, as limited as we are. We're not that limited. So, um, it's so, it's so important. I would add on to that, that when you continue to have pe people without disabilities, non-disabled people play disabled characters, it reinforces that idea of, oh, well, that's because they can't. A disabled person could never play that role. And so media keeps reinforcing the idea that disability equals can't. Um, or don't want to. And um, the more disability stories and media that is made from within the community that's out there, I think the less we will continue to daily encounter the, oh, I didn't know you could, oh, I didn't know that somebody with that could look like that. I mean, here, and, you, and that's not just disability. You hear that a, across all sorts of different identities. Oh, you're awfully nice for that kind of person. You're pretty for that kind of person. And you, you, so you get it in many different um, areas. I mean, that's like the hallmark of how do you know if you're in a marginalized community? Because people come up to you, well, I didn't know someone like you could be talented. Or... And so I think that as any marginalized community is um, given the space to put their media out there, that's when we can kind of burn to the ground this idea of, well, I didn't know somebody could do that. Well, here, watch this movie, you will see, and then stop saying those kinds of things to us. But I think, I think because we are not a super integrated society around disability, we, we need the media to step in and help spread that message of, and not in an inspiring like, yes, I can, but like, don't be so surprised that we're regular people who do things. And I would add, um, even though I'm moderating, that if you can digitally remove someone's legs, then you can digitally add them. So you don't have to hire an able-bodied person to play um, an amputee, for example, because, and I'm speaking of Forrest Grimm, for those of you who know those, that film, because you could actually hire an amputee and you could give them legs just like you could take someone's legs away digitally. And they, and they would have the lived experience and knowledge to play that part. It'd be cheaper too. There you go. <laughs> There you go. Um, how do we dismantle stereotypes in the media? Oh. <laughs> that is a tough one. I mean, stereotypes are um, um, that usually you get hero <laughs> and you get victim, and sometimes you get villain, right? And this, that's sort of like the gamut. Yeah. Um, and the the um, what happens is, is that either there's economic forces that are at work, which are, um, you know, pushing um, people to make shortcuts, or um, media makers are coming at their storytelling with a set of embedded values that are unexamined, which can lead to telling stories that um, where the characters who are depicted, whether it's fic fiction or nonfiction, lack nuance. Um, you know, for example, in, um, in documentary, 
um, one of the things that can can you know really fuel the creation of um, stereotypes and media um, is that is not putting in the time with the people, with the subjects who are being covered. Um, and so, because if you don't spend enough time, then you never get that nuanced um, understanding of that person and their experience, and you never form a, a collaboration with those people or with that person that would allow you to create something that goes beyond stereotype and um, that um, depicts the person not as the representative of all people from their community, which is part of the issue with stereotypes, or, um, or, or gives the false notion that there are only a couple types of people in that community, or depicts somebody as, you know, as the, the victim or the hero, you know, the inspirational story mm -hmm. um, is also something that is, um, can also perpetuate stereotypes uh, as well. Undoing stereotypes is difficult. I look like me. I have tattoos. I have bright colored hair. I shave my head. Um, so people often come at me with a disapproving look. And so I try to be sweet as candy. I am that way regardless, but I try to extra sweet so that I can dismantle that view they already had of me by looking at me. I was like, you, you're, not, you're not understanding who I actually am because you're just looking at me. Um, and then when it comes to the disability stuff, uh, people, it is the, but you look so good. And I'm like, <laughs> Be careful, I might punch you. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> because again, like I just said, I had three really bad days where I couldn't functionally get out of my bed. Ugh. Um, and those are frustrating. Like I am so frustrated when I have those days, but nobody gets to see that because they haven't encountered me as a person. Uh, so when I tell people about that, they're like, oh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And I, I'm just like, don't be sorry. This is just my life. This is what I deal with. And sometimes um, we did have a panel member who had to not be here because they were having a flare-up day. And I am almost grateful for having had my illness as long as I have because I know how to deal with it when I'm having a bad day and to get past um, the flare-up days where I need to attend a thing, but I can't function. How do I get there? How do I get around that? How do I get to that thing? I have had enough experience that I can get there and I can beat those stereotypes of I can't, I can't, I can't, to, well, let's see what path we go around to actually do the thing instead. Um, and so instead of having to call out and sit down, I am able to move forth and I surprise people with that just by showing up on the regular and just by being me on the regular and knowing what I deal with on the regular. Um, but again, that's only me and I don't represent the whole community. And so they see other people and they, it doesn't, still doesn't quite click because they see me and which is frustrating. It's still frustrating. Why do you think there are so few disabled people making and starring in films? There's no training. Places are inaccessible. You show up, oh, I want to learn this. You? I don't know. We don't have anybody who can teach someone like you. Or, or just, I mean, the opportunities are not given. And even, even if you went into a space that was, say, let's say it was physically accessible, that you could get in, doesn't mean it's welcoming. It doesn't mean that the teachers and the classmates will make accommodations um, and make it a place where you actually can learn and can train. Um, but I think, I think overwhelmingly, people just, they just think about the can't. And, and, um, and that there's nothing particularly special about disability, that it's just, well, you just have something wrong with you, so why, why, why should we care? Why should we try to foster disabled people working in the media? Why should we look at that as kind of a diversity or an equity uh, conversation? I think, in general, the population isn't asking, just isn't asking that question, and so that's one of the reasons why there aren't more people. Thank you for asking it. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we kind of addressed this a little bit, but uh, most disabled characters are played by non-disabled actors. And why is this a problem? Because <laughs> the disabled actors with actual, with these disabilities can master what they're trying to do way better than they can. <laughs> like, the able-bodied actor has to train to do this thing to, to, to be seen like we are, and we don't have to do that. We are who we are, and we can represent ourselves. It, the only training we need is maybe a little bit of an acting experience, but these days, you don't need that anymore. Um, not as much, I've seen, as somebody who's acted a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah. We don't need able-bodied people to be playing us. Like, that's just it right there. They don't need to represent us. We can represent ourselves. I mean, now looking back, there was, um, I was just listening to a podcast and, um, about the first 100 years of Hollywood history, and there was this story about how um, uh, Lena Horne was really interested in a part um, where the character that she wanted to play was um, a light-skinned black woman who was passing as white. That was the character. And she was like, I am perfect for this. <laughs> and Ava Gardner, a white actress, was cast in that role by MGM and, and wore the same makeup that, um, that Lena Horne used to enhance her skin tone. Um, and it was just, and they, those two were friends. And I mean, it was, it was funny and horrible all at once. And we look back on something like that and it's like so obvious, like no way you had a white lady playing someone who, you know, was, is a, a light skinned African American woman. Like but what? When you had Lena Horne was like part of your, part of MGM, you didn't pick her, you know. Um, and so we look back on that and we say, ah, oh, those people, they were so clueless. And, but it's like flash forward and now we have, you know, um, a, a long tradition of um, transgender people being played by people who aren't transgender and we have a long history of people getting um, Academy Awards for playing someone who's queer because they're straight and they were so convincingly <laughs> gay. <laughs> um, and now we have, and we also have, you know, this, this uh, habit of casting able-bodied people in roles that should be cast from members of the disability community who, who are performers. So it's like, you know, we're, we're just sort of repeating these things. And, you know, I'm not, and I'm not trying to imply that well, once we, you know, we've moved past the whole problem with, you know, casting, you know, um, African American people because we've got so many examples of African American film stars, not at all, <laughs> and so many examples of, you know, gay and transgender film stars, none, hardly, you know, and so um, I'm not saying that like, oh, don't worry if we wait long enough. There'll be plenty of representations of, you know, actually like, you know, people who are actually from the disabled community um, playing people, who, characters who are disabled. But um, so it's not just going to go away. But right now, I don't think anybody's noticing it that much from the because because of the ableist um, mindset of um, the people who are controlling the messages that are sent to the dominant culture and made by the dominant culture, frankly. Well, it goes back to disability porn, too. I mean, <laughs> I'm disability porn to even my other disabled friends. <laughs> They're like, you have done so well. Oh, my God, I hope to be as well as you. I was like, it's just, it's work. It's all work. I put a lot of work into me and not everybody else, and that's why I'm doing as well as I'm doing. Um, but this is also why I don't wave the disability flag as much as I mean, I put my disabled placard up in my car and suddenly I develop a limp when I get out of my car. <laughs> because you know that that able-bodied person is sitting there staring at you as you get in park and then you're just like, I, crap. <laughs> They're gonna see me and not realize I need to not walk that distance because that's a lot of spoons. Um, but they don't care and they're gonna judge and whatever. Um, so it's, 
it's the disability porn and so when you start to represent your own community then the story comes out about you and it's you've done this despite you've done this instead of you've done this and it's like no I've, I've done this this is part of my life it's just a thing I deal with can you just look at it as that instead of some inspirational factor because it's part of me it's not any different it's part of who I am So what do you think the biggest problem with media representation is today? For me, I think a lot of it is, is just is being one dimensional. You were talking about nuance earlier and, and you've been talking about that there's maybe two different sides, but then it's really a spectrum. There's all different mm -hmm. sides and you, you, we don't have that. We don't have that. Most of what we have is the inspiring Homecoming Queen asked a special ed student to prom. Oh, it's about like how many thousands of shares that gets on social media anytime uh, someone from the general education classrooms asks a student with disabilities to the prom. It bec it's like, my, I mean, Facebook catches on fire every time that happens. And it keeps these representations flat as this student with a disability, as this passive pitiful recipient of this good-natured thing, but that's not at all what it is. It's the person asking them to the prom is puffing themselves up. Good job, me, I asked, I asked the special ed kid to the prom. I'm, I'm a good person. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's just flat. And the examples you gave of the, what was it? In, the, vic, oh, the, the hero, the victim, and sometimes the villain, and we just don't have the nuance because we're not involved in making it because people from those communities aren't involved in making it and because those who are making it are not paying attention. Mm -hmm. And like, and I, you know, as I mentioned before, it could be, there could be economic forces at work, which is like, this is the model we use, just plug it in and play, it's worked, it's made money before, we need to keep making money, let's keep going. Um, so why disrupt that, <laughs> you know? Um, I had a weird kind of experience where as a kid, um, I was in, a documentary about children with disabilities because my best friend has cerebral palsy. And so um, this was in 1975, the Education for All Handicapped People bill was signed by Gerald Ford. And at that time, um, uh, kids, who, kids with, who have disabilities were being mainstreamed, although there was pushback against it. And so it wasn't like, come on in. It was like, stay on out. Yeah. Um, but um, there, was, um, there were some filmmakers that uh, connected with the University of Maryland Medical School. I lived in Baltimore at the time. And they were making these portrait pieces about kids with disabilities. Um, and somehow they, um, they got in touch with um, the parents of my, my friends. And we ended up being in this little portrait film. And what was so strange about the whole thing is how little time they spent with us, first of all. It was pretty much one day, like maybe even less than a full day, um, where we were interviewed and prompted to say things and that maybe just weren't coming out naturally. And they just shot stuff with us hanging out. And um, I, we, we always would make fun of uh, I'd always make fun of my friend Sarah because in, in the video she talks about how she always has to conquer. But, and it was like it's so ridiculous. And, um, and it just didn't, we just knew it wasn't her that she, she just said this thing because she was trying to please the people. And then 29 years later they did a follow up a couple of years ago. And then I got to say my piece because I was older and I knew what was happening. Um, that got cut out. <laughs> um, didn't appear in the in the final. Wasn't time. inspiring enough, Courtney. I, clearly, it wasn't inspiring <laughs> uh, enough. But, but you'll learn you, exactly. And then, but then I think back and I think, well, at least there was some representation of. I mean, here's where I'm like, where I'm like treading on like thin ice here because, partly, I think back and it's like that was a, you know, those people did make a piece of media where um, educators and um, people in the healthcare field could watch these portrait stories about these kids. I mean, I think there was a kid um, with spina bifida and maybe muscular dystrophy, I don't know, but they were trying to show like, these are people who, who you know, are, are living with, with disability and they're mainstreamed into these schools and it's working just fine, so everybody relax. Like that was kind of the message of it. 
Um, and so thinking back on it, it's like actually I, I am kind of glad that was made, even if my friend Sarah is being depicted as this inspirational conqueror, um, which is like, I mean, I find her to be an inspirational conqueror, but not because, be, not for the same reasons why the filmmakers wanted her to say that she was that. So I guess what I'm coming back to is that at least there was some representation and it was doing something and now we need to like start there and move forward and, and create more nuanced depictions. And I think that ends up meaning that we need to take the reins. So, um, and I don't, I don't necessarily think that it has to be someone from inside an upper, underrepresented community who, who has to make it because not everybody really does want to make a film. But, but in partnership with people who do, whether they're from inside the community or outside the community, I think that's where it's at. Um, because wouldn't it be a shame if we weren't um, invited to interact in each other's cultures in a meaningful way and investigate? And in fact, I think that um, you know, having someone come in from the outside, it's sort of, it's like, hey, this is, this is really cool and this is really interesting and this is a really interesting part of your community when like you're in the community and sometimes you don't even recognize like, oh, I didn't think that was of particular interest because I take it for granted because I live it. Um, so in a way, it's kind of interesting to, to have that interaction where there's someone coming in from the outside and you're figuring out how to tell the story. Um, so I think both ways are good. But in any case, I do believe that it has to be um, start with independently created content. We can't sit around, you know, waiting for to be noticed. You know, I mean, the, the truth is, is that at some point, um, all movements become markets, right? So it's like, <laughs> first the Bud Light truck appears at the Gay Pride Parade, and you're like, oh, the Bud Light truck is in the parade. That's, so Bud Light likes us, I guess, you know, it's like, <laughs> I guess because we drink a lot. And then, but then all of a sudden you're like, oh, Subaru commercials, they have like people like me. And then you next, next thing you know, it's like, oh, I'm being marketed to, and now it's like, that's why I'm relevant, because uh -huh. I have purchasing power uh -huh. as part of my group. So I just saw a Target ad the other day, and maybe some people have seen this, mm -hmm. where um, I think they're advertising cosmetics within like the Target, under the Target umbrella. And um, there's definitely somebody in there who, I think she uses a wheelchair. It goes by so fast because it's a commercial, mm -hmm. but I was like, okay, so the disability community is now being seen as a potential market because people with disabilities can spend money. Um, so it's almost like there are certain like phases that, that yeah. communities have to go through. Like you run the gauntlet, you know, of like, well, advertising and like, you know, having your movement politicized by other people who aren't you. And, you know, and then maybe you'll break through and maybe have some decent sort of representation that doesn't involve, you know, whether or not you can spend cash or whether you vote Republican or Democrat. Yeah. That's such a cool example because there's this conference that's happened twice called Lights Media Access. And there's... Yeah, so there's been two. So the first one was all about, hey, um, companies, you should see the disability community as an economically advantaged group, and you need to start targeting your ads toward the disability community. And the first conference was kind of centered around that. And Lights Camera Access 2.0 was, hey, world, we need to set up the media, various media industries so that more people with disabilities are on screen and behind the camera. So within one year, they made that shift from uh, you need to start advertising to no, you need to step back and let them make media. So hmm. that's really cool. I didn't go to either conference, but the write-ups looked really interesting. Yeah. So should we be pushing mainstream media to include us? <laughs> or should we just be independent and do it on our own? I say yes. <laughs> yeah? Both. Why both? not both? Yeah. Both. Both. Because yeah, we're not gonna be we're not gonna be seen, we're not gonna be represented if we don't push for both. Mm -hmm. And um, where it starts is, is us lifting our own community up. So exactly mm -hmm. what what we're doing here and, and what we're trying to represent and, and all of us picking each other up and doing what we can for our community because without us, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I think that um, just like Target and everybody else, they're starting to realize all these people that they've left out, 
we are in the margins, but we're, we shouldn't be on the margins because in all actuality, we're a bigger leader in pretty much everything. We set the standards on the outskirts because we're tired of being sheeples. <laughs> <laughs> so we set our own. And I would say both because why not? I'm, I'm, my good friend AJ does not want to do an independent film. He is ready to move to LA and why, why, why not? He's already starting a documentary that was made in LA and he wants to move there and work in that industry and more power to him. Like not everybody, like you said, not everybody wants to make a film, not everybody wants to make independent media. So I think it should be I think things should be open so that you can approach whichever side you want and kind of tackle the problems there. I don't ever want to be anywhere near LA or any <laughs> Hollywood type filmmaking. I only want to do independent and AJ doesn't want to go near that and so we, I think we should both both be encouraged. Yeah. Okay. So, how do we connect all liberation for marginalized groups in terms of changing media? So how can, we, how can we connect together? I think one thing is to not um, sort of scream that one group has it harder or worse than another. Mm -hmm. Like stop with your activist thing. My group is in a terrible situation. It's not gonna help to do that. So um, I think that's one thing is more banding together and more listening and finding, finding the things we do have in common, but also really acknowledging the things that we don't and how can we work together to, sh to shape things. I don't usually talk so abstractly. I don't even remember what I was talking about now. <laughs> <laughs> that was so abstract, sorry. You, somebody else. I don't think it was that abstract. Because okay. I actually think that if you check your social media feed, there's a lot of policing that's going on where, uh, that's, that I think is not helpful, that is happening from within our own communities and also between mm -hmm communities who are marginalized communities and it's not helpful um, and you know meanwhile the rest of the world is going on and they are completely untouched by this infighting and we're just making it impossible to be effective so I find it not abstract at all I see okay. it constantly the examples of what you're describing yeah. uh, yeah this is not the oppression Olympics um, even within our community we have what what I have called and, and not written a paper on because, you know, that's a lot of energy and I don't have it. Um, the uh, trickle-down oppression because, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's also lateral oppression um, is one of the terminology things being coined. And yeah, it's within our community and we can't move forward if we're all fighting. And this is what the patriarchal, the hegemonic, nasty, <laughs> heteronormative society wants because they can they can manage over us if we're all nitpicking each other, <laughs> and it's it's ridiculous. So uh, there's no there's no oppression Olympics. I mean, we're not on the same levels, and that's fine. We all have our things to deal with, and we're all people. And if we could just band together. Oh my God, we're so strong. <laughs> yeah. we're so strong. So, what are you working on now, and um, what are you doing in the future? Wow, I'm. Um, let's see. You looked at me, Kathy. Oh, sorry. So I'm going for it. <laughs> okay, um, go for it. I'd love to so, hear. <laughs> let's see. Um, well, right now. Um, Distribution is ongoing for a documentary that um, I made in collaboration with um, some friends in Arizona and South Dakota about um, uranium mining in the in the plains. Um, it's called Crying Earth Rise Up, and it was um, funded in large part by Vision Maker Media, which is a branch of um, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And so it's it's on TV around. Um, the, the country, and um, in particular, what I'm excited about is that it's showing in, um, in all, all over the place in, in sort of grassroots kind of, grassroots, grassrootsy kinds of ways. Um, so that's getting around. And um, I've been, you know, working on being, a, um, being on faculty at, the, at Portland State University in the film department. 
um, which is awesome. And there's a lot of great people there doing a lot of good stuff. Um, and I've been doing um, work with my non um, my nonfiction media production projects, including um, I think uh, an interesting um, oral history uh, um, series about. Um, Japanese Americans in the Northwest who worked on farm labor camps during World War II mm -hmm. after they were um, put in concentration camps and then were able to find ways to get out to these farm labor camps. And so um, that's currently playing at the Nikkei Legacy Center down in Old Town, along with um, a set of photographs from that era by an amazing photographer called Russell Lee. Um, in the future, uh, I'd like to keep doing what I'm, what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Can I encourage you to toot your horn a little bit about Crying Earth Rise Up because there are access features on the DVD, right? There are, yes. Please um, toot your horn about that. So one thing that I think is kind of cool is that um, it was, um, closed captioning has always been part of the PBS workflow. I mean, since, I mean, I don't know what, what always means, but since I've been working with them since 2002-ish. Um, but now, um, audio description is also part of the workflow, and that wasn't the case in 2007. So between 2007, when I was working with them on a film called Standing Silent Nation, and 2015, when Crying Earth Rise Up was released, um, all of a sudden, there was this, um, there, you know, on, you know, here's how you deliver. And one of the things that was on the list is audio description. Um, and so that's, that's included on our, uh, um, on our DVDs, for sure. And I think in broadcast. I have cool. to check on that one. Yeah. I'll go Buttons. next. Yeah. <laughs> you have a look of, I'm not ready to talk yet. Um, so I just completed my first probably last, a uh, feature-length documentary film. I, I never sorry, say never. I don't, I don't want to do not. it <laughs> so hard. Not right now. You will later. Yes. Trust me. OK. It's not even distributed. <laughs> so I just completed that. And um, it, I currently have applied to over a dozen film festivals. So I'm waiting to have a, a premiere at a film festival. And then I'll start screening it. I've got um, commitments from. I don't remember, four or five nonprofits um, that are either brain injury related. Oh, the documentary is about artists with traumatic brain injury. So I've got commitments with four or five brain injury related nonprofits and a group called the Invisible, Invisible Disability Project in San Diego. They have this anti ableism series where they do movies. So I've got informal commitments from these four or five or six groups to do community screenings, but I can't schedule them till the film premieres in a festival. Um, that's just the big thing that I've been doing for four years, but also growing my closed captioning um, and podcast transcription business. And I'm taking um, an audio description training course in September. So I'm looking forward to adding that to the kind of access services that I offer to other media makers. Um, so yeah, I don't know what else to say. I think, I mean, this summer, the, I think I'll be doing a lot with the documentary. And getting it out there, yeah. Great. Um, I'm just writing and trying to put together a chat book, as my thing said. Um, I'm also uh, hope hosting an open mic night, uh, third Thursday of every month at this point. In fact, it's tonight after this um, at Everyday Wines on 15th and Alberta. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's only the second one. It's kind of amazing. Um, it's exciting to be doing what I love. And um, I may have just offered to host another one, maybe in another location. Um, those are on the Facebook. Uh, and then I have acted in a couple of things. I would like to do more. I'm already typecast as the angry gender queer person. <laughs> I mean, but you know, gotta represent my community again, because I am kind of the angry gender queer person. <laughs> uh, but I, um, as I can, I'm trying to expand on some of those things. Um, and I'm just trying to write. One day I'll write my memoir, which is kind of a big thing. and. Just doing what I can do when I can do it. <laughs> That's about it. Awesome. So now I'd like to open up to the audience for questions for our panelists. Hi, my name is Stephen. I'm the executive director of FAME. 
Uh, nice to meet you, Kathy. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you, Cheryl, <laughs> and nice to meet the other panelists. Um, great conversation. Really appreciate it. I do not experience a disability. I, I uh, have the great pleasure to be an ally and an advocate um, for people with disabilities and a lot of other underserved communities. Um, my question is this. I'm thinking a lot about uh, uh, Misty Copeland. Misty Copeland is the uh, very wonderful uh, ballerina with New York City Ballet, uh, the first prima ballerina uh, that is African American at New York City Ballet. Uh, and I'm thinking about her because I saw a great documentary about her, and she talked a lot in the documentary about um, uh, upstream solutions, because the question comes up again and again in terms of representation, why aren't there more black folks in classical dance? Uh, and she talks a lot about her interest in, in finding solutions that are upstream, and Cheryl touched on this, the need for training, right? So how can we provide more training opportunities, more development, professional development opportunities for artists who experience disabilities? And so this panel, I think, has done a great job of, of diagnosing uh, many of the problems, and I'd love to hear maybe some more solutions. So I heard training as a solution. Another panelist said, uh, um, ensure that people with disabilities have a voice in creating content. Uh, someone else, and I think Cheryl, this is you again, talked about a friend of yours who is ready to move to LA to start making films. And I think the question on the other end of that is, is LA ready to support AJ and ready to cast AJ? So when you think about systems and when you think about uh, upstream solutions, what, what, what are some ideas we have to tr try to solve some of these problems from a systems change perspective, uh, or from an upstream solution perspective? Changing systems. Anyone want to tackle that one? Um, I will say, and what somebody else was talking about this, um, in terms of AJ, oh yes, you were. AJ is in a lot of collaboration and partnership with non-disabled people with extremely high levels of power and clout in LA. So he's got that going and um, he really, for him, all he needs to do, he's got an agent. The only thing he's missing is the funds to move to LA. That's it. Mm. So um, he has spent the past couple of years forging those relationships and keeping those relationships going. And the documentary that he stars in, um, Morgan Spurlock Presents, I think that's how you say it, Morgan Spurlock Presents, Becoming Bulletproof. Um, that documentary, I mean, it's, it's gotten hot. It's got a lot of reviews. And I think that keeping the momentum going with that documentary is potentially a solution. One of the downsides, now I'm always going to bring up downsides, I'm, I'm angry, um, <laughs> is that when I read reviews by non-disabled people of that film, they kind of make me nauseated. The people, people are, the, I've seen reviews that start with, you wouldn't think a bunch of dis disabled kids could do much, number one. Uh, well, no, I don't think that. But number two, there's no kids in the movie. And they are repeatedly, repeatedly called young people and kids. And there are people pro older than, about close to my mom's age in that movie. And they're all called kids. So mm -hmm. that, that's the flip side of just adding some nuance and, and sort of um, problematizing it a little bit. But I say supporting AJ and, su and supporting his relationships with non-disabled people who've got power and resources and keeping those relationships alive is... More disabled people reviewing the movie, please. <laughs> as, as an educator of the future filmmakers of America, <laughs> um, I, we do talk a, a, a lot about like, okay, let's see what clips we have to show today that are um, examples for whatever we're discussing. And then I talk to them sincerely about how difficult of a time I had in trying to find a group of clips that would actually depict people in situations um, who look like the people in situations that we as, that my class, when I look out at them, that we experience. And um, so we do talk a lot about, um, you know, about how important it is to think before you cast and to think before you write and to think before you choose your subjects and try to pick something that we haven't seen a billion times. I mean, at the very least, let's just see something because it's new, 
you know, and, and not just rehashed, recycled, um, you know, um, stereotypes and cliches of cinema. Mm -hmm. So at, at, the, at the level of like, you know, education, um, higher ed in particular, um, I do, at least in the, in the circles that I sort of am in, I, I have seen, um, you know, a lot, there's a lot of discussion about representing, about how um, underrepresented communities need to be represented and how, and you know, it's, and the fact that it's like a total travesty and ridiculous when these reports come out about, for example, how many, um, how many women are in film in front of and behind the camera and how many African American people are in front of and behind. I mean, there's, there's, it's well documented. And people, I think, are talking about it in higher ed for sure. That will help. I think for, for, I would say one of the solutions I see is that we have to be able to manage, imagine as a culture that, um, that people, that all people can dance or all people can act. When we don't have that shift in thinking, then people aren't going to even begin to think about who participates. So I think there's an underlying thing about like unlearning ableism, just like there is unlearning racism, unlearning homophobia, and things like this that come into play when we're looking at um, when we're looking at training and solutions. Because you have to be able to imagine that first before you're going to like actually have it happen. Um, someone has to have the shift in their framework of thinking. Yeah. A massive program of decolonization and deprogramming. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have pizza. Uh, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Any other questions? Thoughts, answers? You know, with regard to commercials, I think it's, I mean, this goes back a step, I guess, but I think it's not just seeing people with disabilities as consumers who would look, oh, wow, um, Tide uh, laundry detergent used, um, a, I haven't ever seen this, but have used a woman in a wheelchair doing laundry. I'm going to support <laughs> Tide, but, um, which I probably would do, <laughs> but uh, it's going back further and not having advertisers either think consciously or unconsciously, I do not want to depict a disabled person, for example, in fashions or in um, some kind of product uh, because there's such a stigma against disability. I don't want that stigma to attach to my product. So I think it's even more than that. It's not, it's not thinking only that people with disabilities don't have any money to buy anything. It's thinking, I don't want to turn off all my non-disabled people. Yeah. So there, I mean, to me, there is still a lot of stigma out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. And I guess I would, I'm sorry, and I guess I would like any reaction to my negative view of the world. <laughs> it's realistic. Whether it's negative or not, it's realistic. Yeah. Uh, it's the stereotype. It's back to the stereotype thing again. Mm -hmm. You know, is, with busting stereotypes is the is the way through. Because if we aren't familiar with nuanced depictions of certain communities, then we um, don't understand and we feel afraid. And that's like there's a fine line between fear and hatred. Mm. or disgust or repulsion um, and that's where things get really scary um, so yeah it's um, but there are some advertisers taking risks I mean the Axe Body Spray their Super Bowl commercial featured it wasn't just a bunch of of your like standard issue like really fit um, younger men spraying Axe on which they, what they had been doing um, it was a whole grouping of of different types of people, including one person who was a gender queer um, 
person. It was a, a, a man with heels on who was doing some sort of, it was sort of like a performance of some kind. It goes so quickly. So, I mean, it's little things like that. I do smile and I say like, oh, good. You know, but then there's this other side of me, which is also saying like, yeah, that's just because you want us to buy your stuff. Right. Um, yeah. But then I'm like, oh, good. So, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. My name's Jackie. I'm a filmmaker, and I don't identify as being disabled, but I do identify as being chronically ill. Something that I'm just thinking about in terms of solution is, you know, there are these stereotypes where it's like, okay, we can expand the stereotypes, but also I think there's this sort of collective you know, expansion of like a story or the different stories because I see that there's like in a lot of oppression um, narratives it's like here's a finish line and you kind of work against the finish line and then maybe you tackle it because you want to be like us or like some sort of like powerful hegemonic, you know, body which only kind of reinforces that that's the direction that the stories go. So I think part of the solution is, you know, not for the people in the oppressed group like disabled people or, um, people of color to, but it, for like basically a, a larger uh, imagination of all these different stories, of all these different goals, of all these different um, valuable experiences where we don't have to have like good or bad <laughs> days, we just get to have days. Um, so that's what I think part of the solution is. It's like a wide scale, <laughs> like multi-narrative world where we just get to be. Capitalism makes that hard, but <laughs> yes, it does. thank you. <laughs> I think, Byron, you, meant, you mentioned spoons earlier, and I think there is a place where how do we make art and training accessible that isn't as tangible. Um, so if you have to be on set 10 hours a day, not everybody's going to be able to do that. Um, you're not going to have the energy, time, um, energy and physicality chime in please yeah. <laughs> you know they're just this illness doesn't always allow for that chronic illness mm -hmm. disability um so there needs to wait be a way of, I, i'm always thinking because of the work that i do is of how we how we can make art um and on a path that doesn't have to fit this able-bodied mold or this mold of usa fast speed high yeah. <laughs> yeah. production focus you know, how can we do it and still have it, still get funded for it, <laughs> um, and be able to create based on our own bodies and our own energy and in a way that we can participate and there's room for us. It's kind of related to some of the things I've been hearing here. And that reminded me of when I first started my documentary four or five years ago, I don't remember. I, I definitely um, had quite a bit more impairment that I do, than I do now. And so when I was looking for someone to hire to actually film the video, because I'm directing and producing it, um, I would contact people and I would say, you know, what's your rate? We're only gonna work for four hours at a time or less, even though it's a documentary and we're supposed to follow people around, we will never be shooting for more than four hours in a day. Would you work for that amount? Because some people can't afford to take a short work day. They need to work a lot. So I, I would ask people, can you, can you do that? Are you willing to do a half day? And if so, what's your rate? And someone wrote back to me um, and said, oh, I would love to film your documentary. What a great idea. My full day rate, you know, eight to 12 hours of work is such and such. And I'm like, I think, and I think it goes back to you talked about we need to broaden our imagination. I mean, this person clearly meant no harm and didn't mean to ignore me, but couldn't even see, even in the context I gave where I explained because of disability reasons, I actually can't. I could now, but back then I couldn't. And it just could not compute as, well, that's not, a, that, that's not how documentary films are made, but in my world, and even my subjects, because all of them have disabilities from brain injury, sometimes we're like, all right, we gotta end the shoot. This person is like just fading. This person can't, is hardly putting words together. We have to stop. There were times where I would sleep on the sofa of the person we were filming because I was done and with our four hours weren't up yet. And so it just really, it caught my attention. And after that, anybody we talked to or interviewed after that, I would say, do you work for four days, uh, four hours a day? Because I'm not doing any more than that. And if they couldn't be flexible and consider it to still be a real documentary and a real production, I just, 
I just didn't want to talk to anybody who would devalue the production simply because we were sh shooting short days for access reasons, not laziness, but for access. Right, and that this goes back to the question of like, there's the part where you try to like penetrate the um, like the existing structure, and that's like one way, and that needs to be going on at the same time that we're rethinking the you know um, the way that we um, can make art and media and the way that we should be, and thinking about like, okay, well, here's the parameters. What can I do great in these parameters? And, and that's actually something that, I mean, especially working with undergraduates is that there's always limitations, and that's what's awesome, because the limitations are what help you come up with solutions. And so if you recognize, okay, here's, here's the, here are the parameters under which I'm working. What can I do that's awesome? within these parameters. And what's awesome within those parameters is still awesome. It's not less awesome mm -hmm. ever, even if it's not, you know, if it's, so you can have like a multi-million dollar budget Hollywood film done the way that they've always been done. And that can be awesome too. But then the thing that you do that is adjusted for the people who are working on it and for what their particular abilities are and what their resources are, they're still both awesome. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Right? <laughs> you have to take my word for it. It's not out yet. Okay. <laughs> Any thoughts Any, before we close today? Eric. Hi. My name is Eric Ferguson. I'm um, co-artistic director of Wobbly Dance. And we uh, recently made a film. It took us two years. Um, I, can, I can be proud of saying that now because of what you just said up there. So thank you. Um, <laughs> And I just wanted to say, I think one of the best ways to challenge the media is to challenge the way that the medical model is used automatically in the media. Um, one of the things when we've been interviewed for our performances and uh, interviewed about the film is it's almost the first question that you get asked is, what is your disability? And um, we've kind of gotten cheeky about it and said, I never answered that question on the first date. And this <laughs> this one um, journalist, he we were we talked on the phone and then we were texting back and forth and he was up against deadline. He was like, "Yeah, but my editor, she really really wants to know. I don't know what to do." And I wouldn't I wouldn't cave in. And he was like, "Well, I have to ask you a different question then." And I'm like, "Yeah, exactly, exactly." <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yes. just I I think there are different reasons why people you know, want to reveal medical information or not, but it's, it's a real interesting way to play with some of those stereotypes if you withhold for a little while. Yeah. Um, and just my two cents, my experience making film and dealing with the media. That's so cool. Um, my friend Leroy Moore, oh, he had, he got interviewed and he just had the best response for it. So he clearly knows what his disability is and how it affects his life because it's his body and his disability. And he got interviewed for his work in the media and um, running Crip Hop Nation. And he's a, he's a journalist. He, he got, so he got interviewed and the first question, yeah. So what is cerebral palsy and how does this disease affect your life? Well, first of all, it's not a disease. So I feel like if you were a journalist, you might wanna take advantage of Google and at least just check on details. You can Google all sorts of details about all sorts of people. So just a little bit of basic, I think people don't think about that in disability, that they ought to take a minute. But so what is cerebral palsy and how does this disease affect you? And Leroy, he just goes, well, I'm not a doctor, so I can't really talk about medical stuff. And boom, moved on to the next question. <laughs> I was like, Leroy, I've never th I, I never would have thought of such a great answer. And I have it in my back pocket. I've, I've never used it, but I keep it in my back pocket because it's just, it's, it's cheeky too, but it's also it's a little it's a little more confrontational, too. Like, why are you asking me? It's funny. Um, by the way, I've seen your film and it's awesome. And it's going to be at the festival, Yay. so everybody can see it. And also, Sunday night. <laughs> um, I my bio the bio the bio that was read is literally the bio that's going in my the play that is being published. You see it, it mentions nothing. I mean, the whole play is literally about MS and the, the four people who wrote it and the stuff, but it never says anything yeah. because that's not, 
I fight constantly. I don't tell people. On the first date, pretty much we've been dating like a month or two. And maybe by that point, maybe I've mentioned it. Maybe or I've mentioned something that, oh, well, I can't quite go on that hike because that's too many spoons. Sorry. Um, but I have to fight. I have to fight the stigma exactly of being represented as, oh, you're this thing and you're this lesser than thing. And it's like, no, I'm not. I'm not lesser than. I just need to find ways around the thing. Um, and so that's exactly it. I've, I've not technically been interviewed by anybody and rarely do I wave the flag because I have to prove myself before I admit myself. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it is that thing. I'm gonna hold that doctor thing in my back pocket now is too. Well, <laughs> like, I, I can't tell you, I don't know. <laughs> I, and, and, and a lot of people, I look at it as, um, there are things that I've been able, my queerness, my, my gender identity, I've been able to just handle those and think about those where I'm like, this has been like the best thing. And my retirement is amazing. And everybody's like, oh, I'm so sorry you're disabled. I'm like, I'm not. I have been to Paris. I got up in that Eiffel Tower in 20 minutes because I was in a wheelchair. <laughs> there are some pluses and they are amazing. Um, they're few and far between, but they're pretty epic sometimes um but yeah it's not a downfall <laughs> it's not a downfall one thing we haven't really like specifically said i think that might be important mm -hmm. is that um in in this media saturated world that we live in to be underrepresented or represented in a stereotyped way is extraordinarily dehumanizing. Mm. It's easy to dehumanize people who we don't have information about or understand. Um, and so that's the danger in um, lack of inclusion, lack of representation, or poor representation or tokenism. Mm. You know, there may have been some question or some conversation about the effect of lack of appro appropriate isn't the right word lack of um, real representation in the media um, you know what effects that has and I think a lot of it it's really dangerous because a lot of it has to do with policies that are made that directly affect people's lives, for example, what Medicare or Medicaid covers, and you think, well, golly, how are those related? Well, how do you think people that make Medicare and Medicaid decisions, they're not, you know, anointed by God to come down and be wise and make the best, you know, they're people that get their ideas about people with disabilities from the media, and then they promulgate rules like, well, you know, we only cover this if you are homebound. Meaning, if, you're, if you can get outside the house, you're not disabled. I mean, as an example, which I didn't make up, <laughs> you know, that all of these rules that really go against the Americans with Disabilities Act, which talks about inclusion, yet in any kind of program that is supposed to give you assistance so that it is a level playing field, then you're knocked down to like one on a scale of one to 100 or else you don't get the help because you don't need it. You're either disabled or you're not disabled. Anyway. Yeah. I'm Madeline. Um, as a member of the disability community making media, what do you look for in an ally? That's a good question. It's a, it's a really, yeah, please. For me, it's someone who's going to listen and work with you on an even playing field um, where you, you're partners. There's in the disability community, which you probably know, um, in the disability community, which you probably know, there's a lot of times where people come in and it's about people's, about volunteering and about giving charity. And so when you're looking, so I, I, I see that as really being different than when I want to create art with someone I do film, but I also do dance, um, and I've done a lot more dance. I don't have a lot of film experience. But, um, and I, that's what I look for, is something where people are gonna listen and we're gonna be able to come together. 
and work on this even playing field. Um, and that someone's gonna honor my experience of disability, my lived experience, and, also, and my artistic experience around disability in that relationship. I, I, I struggle sometimes too because there, there's a big part of me that um, that hopes that people won't self-identify as an ally, and I, I've gotten yelled at for that. Um, so I know that that's you know that's not everybody feels that way, but I feel like a really great and it totally ties into what Kathy's saying. A really great way to be an ally to someone is to not run up and ask for a plate of cookies because you're such a good ally. I'm your ally. I'm your ally. Hold on. You got to prove yourself. I got to make sure that you're not coming in here to be the helper and and fix my fix my mistakes mm -hmm. so that everything looks really good and professional and not disabled made. So there's all these assumptions underneath that if it's disabled made, it will be bad. Um, that I want help that's not asked for. Um, and I often have asked for help and been t told, no, you don't need it. It's like what Barbara was saying. Of course you don't need help. You look fine. Well, if I asked for it, that's actually because I do need it. So that comes back to listening and really believing and trusting that any of us, we all have agency over our own lives and our own experiences. And when any of us tells each other, I need this, I don't need this, the, the disabled person ought to be trusted when they say that as much as the non-disabled person. So there's a lot of checking assumptions in, in, my, in my world, and I know it's not everybody's, it's holding back and waiting to see if that person with a disability says, you know, you're really being an ally to me. Thank you. I like the way this is going. Sorry, I don't like the way that went. I think that's the thing is, is the listening okay. is the, um, when we do, when we ask for help, I, I don't know about y'all, but like, that's huge yeah. for me. I am, I'm, abs I'm, I'm gonna do it myself until the end, until I absolutely can't. And when I ask for help, it means I'm really asking for help. Um, having somebody actually trust my lived experience and trust that I'm not, I'm not making excuses and I'm not trying to get out of a thing. I'm a, I'm a backwards flaker. Um, I won't flake on a thing, but I won't commit until a thing until I'm all in. And I call that a backwards flaker because I'm like, well, maybe, maybe until literally like tonight, it would be the things at nine o'clock and I'll be like seven o'clock. I'll be like, yes, I'm going to the thing. I'm totally there, but I won't commit until like that point. So don't hold me, don't hold me to things unless I have actively waited and whatnot. Um, an ally is somebody who, yeah, who listens and who, doesn't go back on their words because so often they do. So often they do. I uh, am very careful with friends these days and I've had friends for at this point seven, eight years. Um, but all the ones before that when I was disabled in a wheelchair and needed help, they disappeared. Every single one of them disappeared. Mm -hmm. I have none of them. Um, so I don't necessarily trust people much now. <laughs> uh, Again, asking for help, that's yeah. a big, it's a big step. And I think non-defensiveness too. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, we all make a mistake. And if your response to, if someone says, hey, I didn't, like, I didn't like what you said, or that's not working for me. If your response is, well, but what I meant was, the allyship is totally on hold <laughs> in that moment or potentially longer. It's really about, oh my gosh, okay, well, explain to me what I need to, sorry. <laughs> or whatever words you use to apologize um, and, and let, let me figure out or help me figure out or let me go get a resource to figure out how to not make that mistake again. I'm not a bad person. I made a mistake. But I see it, oh, the defensiveness that we get when we're... And I, I'm not a big fan of screaming call-outs where we publicly shame people for the mistakes. We've got to be generous and learn. But allyship doesn't work with defensiveness and and I assume most people's intentions are good so I don't need to be told but my intentions were it I don't need to hear that sorry let's learn and move on from both ends just because someone may have said something yucky to me doesn't mean that I have nothing to learn from it too we, we all have to learn something from it and then make a movie about it <laughs> 
Okay, well, I think it's about time that we wrap up. Is there any last thoughts from the panelists or the audience? So um, I want to thank you all for coming. I especially want to thank our panelists. We can do a silent clap. Yay! Yay. <laughs> for taking their time and energy and their expertise to be here today. Um, one more plug. May 27th through 29th is the film festival. Um, pdx.realabilities.org. Portland.realabilities. Portland.realabilities.org. And um, check out the film selection. Come Sunday night to watch some of us who have local films in there. And, um, <laughs> and um, I hope you can come and um, give us feedback. And we are geeks at DAC up, and we really want you to fill out our evaluation because <laughs> we like feedback. And um, thank you all. A nice silent clap for all everyone who came. Thank you, thank everybody. So much. <laughs> thank you.